My name's Linda Cairns. I work for Prince Albert Grand Council as their Embrace Life Coordinator. I started that almost 12 years ago um, as part of the National Aboriginal Youth Suicide Prevention Strategy. Um, and so uh, I, did, I do a lot of workshops, you know, licensed workshops like ASSIST to teach people how to intervene. Uh, with people who may be having thoughts of suicide. I've been around for a while, so um, I can, and an educator for a long time, so I can put together any kind of workshop uh, that people ask me to. And I like to meet the needs of those people that I work with. So my mandate is to work with um, youth in particular, but all community members who live on reserve. And PAGC has uh, like 12 bands, but I've been assigned basically 11 communities as my major focus. And that's been a great journey. Um, I guess all of my uh, working career has been with uh, Aboriginal uh, youth. I taught uh, school for 36 years. I started in Red Earth and then I moved to uh, St. Louis and I taught 34 years in St. Louis and got to know uh, and learn a lot about the Métis culture and how rich, how rich it is. Um, and then um, we also introduced the Métis students to their Indigenous culture as well. Um, and that too uh, was spirit lifting, not only for them, but also for me. So uh, after I superannuated, I was uh, sought out, I guess, to restart the Friends for Life program with Canadian Mental Health because of, uh, there's suicide everywhere, you know, it's not, uh, suicide doesn't uh, discriminate, it, it finds uh, a place in a lot of people of all diversities, so. Um, but then this position came up in PA and that's where my husband was, <laughs> so I wanted to go back home and luckily, I got the position. It was new, so they said, okay, do what you need to do with this. And what I soon learned is that I needed to be an advocate for the youth voice. Um, and that's what I've always done. Uh, even when I was in the classroom, I taught students how to respectfully state their views and to get what they needed so that they didn't have to resort to anger or uh, revenge um, or uh, acts of violence in order to get what is at the base of, of their, I guess, their way of getting noticed. So <clears throat> I uh, dealt mostly with um, youth, high school youth, when I first went. But I knew from my past experience that that's way too much weight on the shoulders of youth, expecting them to go back into the communities and be ambassadors for, and to bring up the topic of suicide and mental wellness. Because 12 years ago, nobody wanted to even say the word suicide. So I then got to know um, young adults because I do other programs and we have women and men's programs out of the Holistic Wellness Center where I work in uh, Prince Albert. And they come looking for, I guess, a better way, you know, how to live maybe differently than they're living today. So through that, like I said, I got to know a lot of young people and started to realize that the majority of um, the young adults in our community do not have a purpose. 
And so their self-esteem is very poor. And since they have nothing to do, um, sometimes that idleness leads us to poor choices. So I thought, they need a voice because they have a lot of gifts that can really help not only the youth in the community, not only their children, because a lot of them are parents, but also their parents and their cookums and mushums. And I stirred the pot a little bit, getting it started, but I was lucky enough to get a, a chief in one of the communities. That was always been a dream of his too, to have um, youth not necessarily have a political voice, but to be that kind of social barometer in the community uh, like when things aren't going good, like tell us so that we can deal with it before it becomes a crisis. So with his, his outline that he had put together, we struck up a, um, what we call our first, uh, first chapter, I guess, of what we call YAC, which is our Youth Action Council. And what I inspire or try to inspire them to do is to believe in themselves. Um, and how do you learn to believe in yourselves? Well, you learn that through sharing your gifts. And everybody has a gift. I, and I don't believe that there's anybody that's bad. Uh, I think um, sometimes we haven't been given opportunity to, to show our, our goodness. Uh, but I, I've always had high expectations of the young people that I work with, and I have never been disappointed. Uh, they rose to the top. They rose to the top, and they went uh, above and beyond. And we have um, one community in particular. Uh, the young adults refuse to be paid for what they do. They believe that's the way it's meant to be. So. Uh, for instance, this summer, uh, they asked if I would help them put together a proposal for equipment. Because this one community has over 800 kids under the age of 18. So they could have leagues of their own day eh, with those kids. And not all kids have an opportunity to play organized uh, sports. So they chose soccer and ball. And they formed teams. And all they asked for was the equipment and a little bit of money for snacks and water. It was hot this summer. Uh, but they refused to pay anybody because they believe uh, that it's our job as community members to help one another out. And as parents, if we want our kids to thrive, then we have to become part of that journey along with them. And that's what I support. Every community does it different. Um, you know, um, but I've really been amazed at how giving uh, young adults are, if given the chance. And in one community in particular, two who were involved in the YAC are now counselors, <laughs> they, and it's showing that it's making a difference in the community because the young people are going out to vote, you know. So, yeah. That's what I like to do. And so suicide prevention to me is life promotion and life protection. Uh, so I, I'm one that believes that the glass is half full, not empty, and that as communities of people, we need to build on the strengths that are already there so that we can fill that glass and... Uh, help tackle those things that uh, need more work in order to find a solution for it. So that's what I am. Uh, I facilitate, I'm a mentor, I'm a cheerleader. Um, I believe in planning, and that's the other thing that I instill in the youth, that if you don't plan, you plan for failure. And so they have learned how to plan, how to create a budget, how to put together a project that's meaningful to them. And we all know that if youth and young adults take ownership, 
they're not going to damage what they build, you know, or what they create. So the target age group through Health Canada uh, were to work with youth, and their their definition of youth is 10 to 30. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in some of our communities, their YAC group goes to the age of 35. Uh, and that, they believe that, you know, at the age of 24, and that's usually when the brain is more fully developed, that a lot of young people are looking for a better way. And uh, if they have older ones that are part of the group who've already started that journey, then there's a better chance for them to continue because they'll have that support, that support on the side. We have another community that just goes to the age, they go from 12 years to 26, I think. Another community goes from eight years to 28. So it, I leave that up to them um, because I'm not, I'm not there to tell them what to do. All I encourage is we have, to, we have to stop doing for people. We need to do with people. We have a right to be independent. And I guess in some circles that's called decolonization. And that's what we need to promote. And that's what we promote through, through YAC. We can do it. We will do it. And... Uh, when I was first interviewed for, for YAC, I told them, I'll be honest with you, there's ebbs and flows, hey? And usually they, those match elections in the community. Um, yeah, because uh, I know that youth is important to everyone, but um, sometimes the actions don't match the words. <laughs> and uh, So we have to be there to support one another so that we keep going because it's hard work. A lot of these youth have never been given the opportunity to be a leader, and so all of a sudden they'll say, yeah, go ahead, do what you want to do. But they need that guide on the side, you know, so that when they slip, that person can be there to help them up. Instead of waiting until they're drowning in their things that didn't go that well, and then they said, see, I told you, they can't do anything for themselves. The lack of support is a big issue, uh, not only for yak, but also for healing. You know, people come out, they go out for help, be it with any kind of addiction or uh, mental health issue, even physically health, physical health issue. If they don't have the support in the community to help them, uh, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult journey. And it's very easy to become codependent in, in my job because I want to see them become as successful as they can be. So sometimes I have to get pretty hard-hearted, <laughs> you know, and say, no, I will not do that for you. I will do it with you, you know, or did you think about trying this? And if they say, no, I don't want to do that, I don't force it on them because that's how you learn. Hey, isn't that how we all learn? You know, you learn from your your struggles, and uh, those struggles just make you stronger if you go in it with the right attitude. And that's what I do. I'm a very positive person, and I always look for the good or the silver lining and everything, and that's what I try to get the youth to think, too. So those are the, yeah, those are the kinds of, uh, and of course, money. But there's lots of things that you can do in a community uh, to make life better for yourself and for the youth in general that don't cost a whole lot of money. And one of them is taking kids out on the land, teaching them how to hunt. No, that doesn't cost a whole lot of money. Um, you know, having them spend some time with elders. And... But I think with more and more with all this all the land, on the land stuff, I've, now my biggest concern is that ribbon skirt making is very popular, but it shouldn't become a craft. It's still a ceremony. And then when you do make that ribbon skirt, um, you put 
you put your struggles and everything out there in that skirt, you know, and it's not just, oh, I've got a pretty skirt, you know, and uh, same thing with making drums. There's protocols that go with that, you know. There is a responsibility that goes along with that. And that's what we're trying to do with the youth. And you know, the youth want it. We have some very Christian communities, but the youth are saying, I believe in God and Jesus, but when I hear the drum, it speaks, it speaks to part of me. I want to know more. I cannot reject what I don't know. And they want to know more. And they're hungry for it right now, which I think is what gives a lot of people hope, you know. Um, we use the, um, the AFN wheel, you know, the one that's right at the center. I don't know if you've ever seen that medicine wheel, but right in the center, it's belonging. And then in order to move anywhere in life, you have to have that sense of belonging. Um, be it to a family, be it to uh, an organization, or even in school to feel like you belong there, or even to a community. In order to do that, then you need to have a purpose. You're not just, just to be. There's more to it than that. And then once you do that, it gives you life meaning, and then there comes hope. And the other favorite model that I instill in them is uh, the circle of courage, you know, where, again, belonging is important because until you feel that you're be you belong and you're part of that learning, um, you don't learn the skills that you need to know because you're still feeling, I don't belong here. You know, nobody cares about me here. Uh, be you adult or child or youth. And then once you have those skills, you've got to learn how to use them with a mentor or a guide or a supporter at your side. And the biggest thing is to give back because when we give back, we get so much more in return. And generosity, it builds self-esteem. You know, it really does build self-esteem. So, I also <clears throat> know that I believe the medicine's in the community. We had Dr. Thera um, a couple years ago now. And his message really resonated with a lot of people, a lot of us who attended there in that you don't have to go outside to find people who fix your community uh, or your life, it's right here and in the people around us. And we have so many gifted people in our communities who are never given the opportunity to share what they know, you know. And in particular, the elders, they're not being used the way they used to be. That model basically tells us that, you know, before contact, um, Everyone in a community had a purpose. And the purpose was to grow a child into to be a good elder. Okay? That was the purpose. And, and some say that we've lost that way. We've lost that way through colonization, uh, through um, residential schools, you know, through uh, welfare, through all of the violence, you know, that, um, that is part of the everyday way of life in our, in our communities. And the youth are saying, we have enough, but how do we get rid of it? And so we have one faction of the youth who are saying, come on, we got to do something positive here. And we have another that are so hurt, they're going the other way, trying to get the attention of people, uh, and saying, why are they behaving that way? Why are they joining gangs? Why are they killing one another? You know, and I think we all have a role in that. 
you know, and that's, I think, where uh, uh, reconciliation comes in, empowerment. That's the biggest goal, is empowerment. The belief in yourself, that within everyone lies a leader, not a big L leader, but a small L leader, because we all need to take responsibility to lead in some way, shape, or form. The biggest, and the other second biggest goal is to um, give them the opportunity to share their voices, you know? And so I am a co-chair of a committee in the North uh, called Embracing Life Committee. And our major reason for, for uh, being together is, uh, so, you know, t to work on suicide prevention and awareness. And the last meeting I brought representatives from five of my YAC groups. And uh, there was another youth, uh, a youth that came from La Ranche to, you should have seen when they got together, the energy in the whole room just changed. Because they've got hopes, they've got dreams, they just need, they need that support. Um, to move forward, and that's that's basically my goal. And through that, we're preventing suicide because we're teaching them that life is worth living. And through the skills that they gain, they learn how to help protect life and to promote life through the activities that they come up with. You know, and through the care that they show when they help one another. So that's, 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 you know, it sounds simple, empowerment, but a lot of people don't understand that. Communities who have given support to their young adults, they've, we've had young adults who have thrived. The only problem is, is recruiting more young adults because uh, once they get into it, they get so passionate about it that they almost burn themselves out because uh, they forget about balance. Eh? You can't give your all to giving to others. You've got to look after yourself and your family. So that becomes part of, uh, part of the teaching. And then I ask them. We usually have two, uh, two skill building sessions a year. And I say, okay, what do you need? You know, what are we going to work on? So, uh, and then I go from there, you know, trying to continually build their toolbox so that they can go on. And I have to say that first group that I worked with, uh, when I first, when we first worked with the young adults in that community, only about three percent of the community lived off reserve. And now, when I go there and look for some of those young adults that I first worked with, they're working. They're out getting an education. You know, they're out raising a family. They've, they've moved away so that their needs could, the needs that right now um, can, uh, can thrive, you know. So, uh, so it feels good when I, when I see that kind of thing happening. I'm not indigenous, but I've had some good teachers I, uh, I've been blessed with knowing uh, some really great elders who have taught me a lot. And Indigenous education, uh, I know, has a connection to all things. And I know that it has its roots in the verbal rather than the written format. So we try our best that way. But, you know, the youth in particular, they're very uh, pulled to technology and to the social media and those kinds of things, which is starting to erode some of our communities who still have their first language. But they're working on it. <laughs> you know, like they're, um, they've started to realize that, hey, that's, that's happening. So, Indigenous education to me is holistic in, in nature. You know, it, it honors the wheel where we are 
well physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And that if we were going to go there full-fledged, then that would be internalized as our way of living. You know, and that's what it is to me. And I think it's so rich that way. But unfortunately, in some of our communities, all those teachings have been lost. And now the youth are saying, we want it back. And it might not be exactly as it was in the past, but they're looking. They're looking for those elders who are going to be willing to teach them and to uh, remind them um, who they are as Indigenous people. In my my experience, um, it is a strong um, strong culture, resilient culture, you know, and uh, and I try to share the teachings that I've been given to pass on to create that foundation of strength and courage to uh, to look at the past to know of that journey but not for blame but for reconciliation okay? so that we can move forward together and as a non-indigenous person I do believe it's part of my responsibility to be part of that journey too you know, for a true reconciliation to to happen, you know, so that's that's what it is to me. Well, thank you for this opportunity, you know, because we've tried for a long time. We've developed two or three communities, but this one, uh, projects, but this one, I'm particularly, I'll never let this one go as long as I'm continuing to work because... Uh, the youth need that kind of support so that they can become um, the great leaders of tomorrow, okay? Um, and so all I say is, come on, people, let's, let's work together. Uh, let's focus on the goodness in everybody, you know, and... Uh, and share that laughter, which is so much part of the culture, <laughs> and and that care, that care for one another. Yeah, that's a, that's about what I want to say. So thanks for the opportunity, because we tried to get researchers to label us as a best practice, because that's what funders need in order to give you resources. And then I realized that was only the opinion of four people, <laughs> usually. And I knew that a lot of this was making a difference. So I was so happy to be invited by the University of British Columbia to share what we do with, uh, with our young adults. And our goal is to try to get this into all of our communities. But, you know, that's the other thing I learned is patience because not everybody is ready. This is a big step. And if the youth don't have the support in the elders and the leadership in the community, it's a hard journey.